final song before the message this morning. Hymn number 90, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. All four stanzas, <clears throat> hymn number 90. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. What, what great, great words. Deuteronomy chapter 1 this morning. Well, this morning, I'm going to do something a little, little different. I'm going to look at a thematic. Got to turn my mic on. Thank you. I'm going to look at a thematic study this morning in the book of, of Deuteronomy. And with the new year upon us, I have to imagine we all have some uncertainties, perhaps fear of what the new year may bring. And, and I, I believe a message on a theme in the book of Deuteronomy um, is going to be very helpful, very apropos for this being New Year's Eve. Deuteronomy chapter 1, that can be found on page 146 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. The year was 1933. America was in its worst economic crisis in history. The country faced 25% unemployment. There was a collapsed stock market. Those that were lucky enough to keep their jobs, they saw their wages decrease by 43% in just four years. Agricultural devastation was beginning to impact food sources. Slums of, if you want to call them homes, and neighborhoods were, were beginning to pop up, of, made of just packing crates and abandoned cars. They were growing in cities. Another potential world war could perhaps be on the horizon due to the rise of the powerful, newly elected Nazi Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Fear. Fear was the dominant theme of the era. Such conditions set the stage for 
really what became a most popular American slogan. FDR entered his presidency, and in his inaugural address, he uttered the famous words, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Well, I'd like you to rewind the clocks back about 3,500 years to the year 1400 BC. And Moses is not giving an inaugural address, but he's kind of giving a farewell address to a nation that we have recorded for us in the book of Deuteronomy. And fear was a very real part of Israel's current play. There was many variables. There were unknowns. There was changing circumstances that was feeding into more unknown. Uh, Israel, they're on the verge of entering the promised land. What a journey it had been for them. Israel was in bondage for over 400 years in Egypt, and by miraculous work of God, he redeems them. They, they're freed and escape slavery. They spend about a year at Mount Sinai, and then because of fear, actually, a whole generation ends up wandering in the wilderness for about 40 years. They, they finally make it now to the Jordan River. They're about to cross over, about to enter the Promised Land. They're on the verge of battle entering Canaan. And, and Moses begins sort of a, a final pep talk. And he begins in Deuteronomy chapter 1 by reminding Israel why they're in the position they've been in for wandering for four decades, which was because of the previous generation's really improper fear, a fear of enemies. Disobedience leads to rebellion. And he reminds them in the book of Deuteronomy about the Ten Commandments. He gives a collection of laws that are many unique to ancient Israel in their historical setting. And Moses tells them that God, the one true God, has set them apart, has set Israel apart for himself, and they must be different from all the other nations with their many, many false gods. He implores them, have total devotion to God by following God's laws. And that it's God that the emphasis should be on. And that you should have an emphasis on God's fear. That God actually wants them to have fear. And this theme of fear is very real in the book of Deuteronomy. And that's what we turn our attention to this morning. Yes, Christian, God intends you to have fear. You say that that really contradicts the beliefs that I have, that unsettles my feelings. However, from God's word, we're, we're going to see this morning that his fear is not a fear that leads you to be in dread. The, the biblical understanding of fear requires some, some real clarification and some definitions. But we're, we're going to see this morning that because God wants you to have a proper fear, okay, a proper fear, the exact opposite must be true. There must as well be an improper fear that God does not want you to have. And these, these two conflicting truths, they also bring two conflicting ramifications. So from Deut Deuteronomy this morning, here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn God desires that you live a life of proper fear. And we have to understand God's desire for you to live in a proper fear but we first have to understand exactly what an improper fear is and why it's dangerous. So we're going to be looking at multiple passages this morning. We first have to understand, okay, understand that there is an improper fear and that an improper fear brings personal doubt and brings dishonor to God. So we're going to first explore improper fear and the components of it. Here's a first reality that we see on this theme of fear in Deuteronomy. First, do not fear when you're outmatched. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And, and since this is really a lengthy passage, and a lot of the passages that we're looking at this morning are, are lengthy, we're really going to move through them and highlight the main points for emphasis on the screen. Okay? This is not my, my usual expositional style, but, but I think it's really practical to do a themed approach here and observe just from one book of the Bible all that it has to say, not even all, we're going to touch on some of the components of fear, and don't worry, next week we'll be getting back to verse by verse, working our way through a, a moderately sized book of the New Testament, probably take us six months, but this morning we're just covering a bunch of different ground in the book of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses is kind of fulfilling a, a role, filling a role of historian here. He's recounting 
the punishment of God against this previous generation and their fear, much of this can be found in Numbers 13. So at this point, Israel, okay, they, they've made the difficult journey through the terrible wilderness. Verse 19 tells us that. Moses is telling them, you've almost arrived, okay? The, the ETA, if you will, on the GPS is telling them the destination is close to the land that God has in store for you. He, he says, it's yours for the taking. Verse, verse 21, uh, go up and possess it. But here is a really critical line of the text. The text says in verse 21, fear not, neither be discouraged. Well, again, we're looking at what happened previously. So what happens is Israel commissions 12 spies, and they, they go on kind of a, I guess we could call it a reconnaissance mission of sorts. And two things occurred when they bring back their findings of this land that God had promised to them. One, there was just visual proof that the land was a wealthy land. Verse 24 tells us that. But, but here's the more important thing that happened when they brought their findings back. A fear sets in. A fear of the enemy. It, it leads them to believe they're outmatched. Verse 28, particularly, we see that they say, the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakims there. Um, so, so not only are they saying, hey, the city walls are too big. They seem impregnable. The people are too big for them. These, these, these sons of Anakims, these were known to be giants in the land. Hey, we're, we're outmatched here. And Moses assures this generation, hey, listen, verse 29, dread not, neither be afraid of them. And, and then Moses, he details all the mighty works that God had accomplished for them. Hey, hey Israel, you've seen God work miracles. You've seen him work wonders. Why would you trust that he doesn't do it again? See, Moses is seeking to use past experiences to drive to future trust. But Israel's improper fear, it, it brings disastrous results. Uh, notice the, the emotions and the actions of the Israelites' behavior. Um, their actions are described as rebellion against God's commands, verse 26. There's murmuring in verse 27. Verse 32, unbelief in the Lord, emotional instability, fear we see is detailed. Verse 28, discouraged hearts. Verse 29, there's dread. Perhaps the most telling reason that God gives through Moses as to why his people should not fear when it appears that they are to their eyes outmatched. I think it's found in verse 30. It's so critical. Moses says that God... The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you. He shall fight for you. If there was one concept that should have just, you know, stirred faith over fear and trust over doubt, one would think it would have been this proclamation, hey, God will fight your enemies for you. Why would Israel not fear in that case? God will fight for them. But we know they had an improper fear and the results were da disastrous. You know, for many, the school bully is a, a haunting reality, a haunting memory. You know, that, that one kid or that group of kids that, that maybe they were stronger than you, they, they, they just make you shake with fear, they can embarrass you, maybe it's just verbal. You endure, you know, constant paranoia. You're, you're potentially fearful of an altercation in the hallway, the bathroom, the playground, whatever it might be. I went to a kindergarten to 12th grade Christian school. And while it was subdued, bullying was still present. As the shortest and weakest in my class of 14, I was a really easy target. I was often insecure and I was, I was bullied at times. And I lived in a state of, of unsettled fear and discouragement and, and angst at times. But at the age of 10, something happened for me. Something happened through no doing of my own. A young man came into my life named Jim. Jim was a 16-year-old that had been saved in our church's bus ministry, and he had a tremendous testimony. He loved the Lord, and he was always present, not just on Sunday mornings. He got different rides. He wanted to be in church on Sunday night. He got a ride from someone else so he could be there on Wednesday. He was a godly young man. 
But at age 16, for all intents and purposes, for a period of his life, his parents basically left him to fend for himself, and he worked at night at McDonald's to try to cover the apartment, uh, small apartment expenses and pay for his own way to Christian, uh, Christian school. And my parents and the church found out about it, and my, my parents took him in to our home for his last two years of high school. And ever since, he's been my loyal big brother. By far, Jim was the strongest kid in school. Jim was just strong, and he, he was tough as well. But immediately, he forcefully let it be known, I mean, within a couple of days of him being in our house, that the usual bullies in elementary, hey, the bullying for Matt Calciano's over. He let it be known. And, and a few days after his first speech, one of these usual bullies was threatening me. And just at the right moment, Jim popped around the corner. And with, with just a few words from his deep voice, the bully fled. And from that day forward, I rested in the confidence of Jim's presence at my school. Every day thereafter, when we'd walk into the, the school parking lot, if we were at a distance and I would see the usual boys that I was a little fearful of, Jim would just walk a tiny bit in front of me and make me feel a little bit more comfortable. And he'd say as we're walking and he'd look down to me, don't, don't worry, little brother, you're with me now. They have to get through me to get to you. Remember what I did for you. Don't have to worry about it. If you're a child of God, in a, a similar fashion, but, but I'd say infinitely intensified, that's what God offers to you. That's what he offers to you. Your enemy is going to be unique, all right? Whatever your enemy may be, that's unique to you. But the truths of Scripture, they're all the same to each one of us. Why would we fear enemies if, if God has promised to fight for us? Through no doing of your own, you have been united to Christ. That's Romans 6, 5. You've been uh, received adoption. You have God as your father, Romans 8, 29. Christ is your brother by adoption, Romans 8, 15. The God who fashioned all of creation, Colossians 1, that's constantly upholding and ruling all of creation, Hebrews 1. He who is everything and everyone must go through him. And just like me with Jim, when Jim said, hey, they have to go through me to get to you, that's really what Christ offers you. In essence, nothing can touch you that does not touch him. You don't have to win the battle. He will. You don't have to overcome the enemy. He will. You don't have to overcome the adversary. He will. You don't have to fear. Why? Because God will fight for you. First, we see that you do not have to fear when you are outmatched because... God will fight for you. I want to see a second truth this morning on improper fear from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Do not fear when you are outmatched. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Well, the, the setting and the context here in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's different than chapter 1. But there, there's many similarities Okay, so, so through Moses here in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God is warning Israel they must thoroughly cast or, or drive out the many nations in Canaan. Verse 1. These nations, they're not just superior in might. It's, it's evident that they are vastly superior in size. Uh, we see, it says there is seven nations, many nations, verse 1. Well, God promises deliverance, okay? He, he, he continually is imploring them, be, be rid of these lands and these nations, okay? When you go in, thoroughly remove them, because if you do not, God prophesies, prophesies which, which unfortunately comes to, comes to pass later in their history. He says, if you do not totally rid them of your land, eventually you'll uh, adopt their culture, you'll assimilate to their idolatrous worship practices. God highlights, hey, I didn't choose to save you, Israel. I didn't choose to love you. Um, I didn't choose to love you because of who you are, but simply because of who I am. Not because of your size, not because of who you were, because of who I am. Verses 6 to 9, we see that. And then we draw our focus to verse 17, where God kind of demonstrates his omniscience, that he knows all things and he exposes he knows what Israel's thinking. He's, he knows their thought process. Israel is thinking, these nations are more than I. How can I dispossess them? Um, and, and I love the response from God in verse 18. 
thou shalt not be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. And he sets the pattern again by, by directing them off of what they perceive to be the magnitude of the problem in front of them and looks at the magnitude of himself as the solution. Don't, don't worry about the problem. Just, just rest in me. Remember who I am. Remember what I have done. Another repetitive comfort in verse 21. Don't be afraid of them. Focus on my greatness, not on the greatness of the number of the Canaanites. God directs to his past glories to ensure a current trust in his future plans. And all the emphasis of action in this passage, it's all on God's working. Uh, verse 20, God will send the hornet. Um, verse 22, God will put out the nations. Verse 23, God will deliver and destroy the enemies. God will do everything. Trust in him. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, we saw that God tells Israel, hey, do not fear because I will fight for you. Well, in this passage in verse 21, why should Israel not fear even though they're drastically outnumbered? I love the answer from verse 21. The Lord thy God is among you. And then it tacks on a mighty God. The Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God. As a follower of Christ, it's always going to appear in this world that you're outnumbered. God does not keep this truth as a secret from you and I. Scripture details the way of salvation is narrow and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 14. Matthew 9, 37. The laborers are few. Matthew 22, 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, the power is not in our perceived numbers. The power is in God who's among you. And, and lest you forget, he's a mighty God. Well, first we saw do not fear, looking at improper fear when you're outmatched. Then we saw do not fear when you're outnumbered. Here's the, the third one this morning that we see. Do not fear when you face the unknown. But by the way, are these not the three buckets that just still to this day seem like give us the most fear? Outmatched, outnumbered, unknown. Deuteronomy 31. We're just going to be looking at three verses in this passage. If Deuteronomy is, is sort of similar to, um, you know, a last will and testament of Moses, if you will, chapter 31 would sort of be like Moses' you know, his, his deathbed wishes. Because following this dialogue, in verse 14 of chapter 31, Moses is told he's going to die very soon. And Moses is acknowledging his time is short, and he's passing on the, the baton of, of leadership to Joshua. So, so there's not only this unknown for Israel of what to expect when they enter the land, right? For 40 years, they've had the same routine, day in and day out. Well, now there's this what's going to happen in regards to the fighting and the journeying. They're on uncharted waters, but they're going to have to do this without their God-appointed leader of the last four decades. I, I think certainly the people have seen Joshua's valiant and courageous military leading. They've seen his faithful service to Moses, but, but now he's replacing Moses. And Moses had been just this steadying leader for, for many, many years, kind of a, a human security blankets of sorts for them, if you will. And now Israel's got to venture into the unknown. Well, God promises again, he'll provide the victory in verses 4 and 5. In verse 6, Moses reiterates to Israel as a whole, and then to Joshua as a leader, the same theme. Do not be afraid of what lay ahead. He, he urged both in an address to the nation and to Joshua. Verses 6 to 8, hey, fear not, nor be afraid. Fear not, neither be dismayed. I, I imagine that they, they had so much uncertainty about what lay ahead at this juncture. Right, we, we have the fully revealed Word of God here. We know what happened. But at this point, they're wondering, there's a lot of unknowns here. Uh, a lot of unknowns. Well, in, in, in chapter 1, they were instructed to not fear God because God would fight for them. In chapter 7, hey, don't fear because God was among them. And then in verses 6 and 8 of chapter 31, Moses says, hey, do not fear. Why? For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. I want you to listen to this definition. Persistent or chronic fear. Fear that becomes problematic and impacts your emotional, social, and physical life. A fear of the lack of predictability and control. 
a void of predictability leading to an increased sense of feelings, anxieties, and uncertainties. This is the definition of xenophobia, or a fear of the unknown. This is nothing new, what we're seeing with Israel. And Christian fear of the unknown, it, it can cripple you. It can cripple you emotionally and physically and psychologically, but the anecdote from Scripture for a fear of the unknown is to dwell on that which God has made known from His Word. Many of the aspects of the future are unknown to you. That's why they're the future, right? There, there is certainly unknown, but, but remind yourself, you know He who already has established the future. You know the Sovereign Lord, and His promise, by the way, that He made to Israel, that remains the same and it's unchanging. You say, well, this promise to Israel here in Deuteronomy, this was under the Old Testament covenant, unique between Israel and the, and the Lord. Well, this same promise was made under the New Covenant to Christians. In Hebrews chapter uh, 13, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we, I love this, may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The negative effects from, from Scripture on improper fear, they're so clear. But God is just as clear. There's a proper fear that He does set forth, and He does explain, and He does demand of His followers. And this, this theme of a proper fear of the Lord, a proper fear, is all throughout the book of Deuteronomy. But what we're going to do is just look at one shining example in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's where we'll be for the remainder of our time this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we will see if an improper fear brings personal doubt and dishonor to God, a proper fear brings personal peace and glory to God. And we're going to see three components of what a proper fear of the Lord looks like. First, a proper fear obeys God lovingly. This passage in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is known by uh, Israel as the Shema. Okay, that's the word in Hebrew. It simply means hear. This passage is a passage that was so important that every little boy and every little girl, as soon as they could speak, they were taught this passage and they memorized it. And the concept of obedience associated with a proper fear of the Lord, it, it's all over this passage. Uh, notice these words in the text illustrating there's an expectation of obedience. The motions to be done are clear, okay? Israel is to do. That's action. That's used twice in these 13 verses. Uh, the, the word command or commandments, that's used five times. Hey, there's this ongoing obedience that it's expected. Uh, that's illustrated by the words keep, observe. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual obedience and does it lovingly. Th this concept of keeping God's commands, it's not unique to this chapter in Deuteronomy. It's found in Deuteronomy 5, 29, 8, 6, 13, 4, 17, 19. Um, the, the use of the word walking is here, which continuing obedience that word walking in commands is used in Deuteronomy 8, 6, 10, 12, 13, 4. Why am I highlighting this? Because the use of repetition is God's way of saying, hey, don't miss this. This is important. Also, notice, you know, obedience, it's not selective. It's not just what you want to obey. It's all-encompassing. God is clear of that. We see him say all his statutes and his commandments for all the days all. This pairing, by the way, of statutes and commandments, when you see these two together, you ought to, you ought to pay attention. The, the statutes and commandments found together, it's found 14 times in the book of Deuteronomy. The statutes and commandments coupled together. Verse 5 intensifies this, this wholehearted obedience even more. It, it's never just, and we looked at this this morning in Sunday school, it's never just the motions that matter to God. It's the motive behind the motions, a motive of love. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Besides here in verse 7, this same concept of loving with all thy heart, soul, and mind, it's mentioned five other times in Deuteronomy. Again, repetition is God's way of saying this is important. Um, also see that it's something that it's expected. It will be taught, that word is used, to the next generation. God's people understand they need to be taught to learn of Him. 
And the more they learn of him, the more they'll reverently fear him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we, we see this proper and reverent God-honoring fear. It's motivated by one thing in verse 5, love. And these two aspects of obedience and love, they're, they're inseparable. They're inseparable in, an, in a proper fear of God. Love precedes the act of obedience. One can obey without loving, but one can never love without obeying. They are coupled together. Verse 6 tells us these laws should be written where? In the heart. And then we see the actions in verse 7. What is this demonstrating? Long before these occur externally, they must be first internally. Love is a decision. Uh, it's a decision. The, the call from God, hear Israel in verses 3 and 4. When he says hear, it's not just be present. And, and just have auditory, you know, sound waves getting into your eardrum. This means listen and obey. Follow. You see, true love obeys lovingly. Love chooses to obey. So the fear of the Lord is not some, some debilitating fear that leads you to paralysis. A fear of the Lord is an enabling fear that leads to obedience. You know, this, 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 this word of God here, Christian, it is not just some ancient relic of historical information, uh, specifically in Deuteronomy. This information is not just applicable to Old Testament Israel and bears nothing for us today. Now, now many of the laws, okay, uh, specifically the, the ceremonial, ritualistic, and dietary laws, they don't apply to the New Testament Christian. But, but the intent and the timeless truths of God's Word still do. What does Christ say of His followers? They prove their love for him by keeping his commandments, John 14, 15. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 describes the way to peace and happiness as through obedience. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. The, the age of grace, the, the church age, the, the New Testament age, this does not mean the entire Old Testament is no longer relevant. But you know what it does mean? It means that the Christian has a promised new heart, regeneration, that allows followers of Christ, through the Holy Spirit's enabling, to obey faithfully and love God fully. First, a proper fear obeys God lovingly. Secondly, we see in Deuteronomy 6, a proper fear serves God peacefully. This kind of sounds paradoxical, I have to imagine, right? Fear and peace, they don't usually go together. Um, but, but this wouldn't make any sense were it for the foundation that we just laid of what a fear of the Lord is. Verse 13 uses a word very unpopular in our vernacular today, serve. Serve. This concept of serving the Lord, it's mentioned in Deuteronomy 7.10, Deuteronomy 7.20, 10.12, 10.20, 13.4, the culture of servanthood. That's not thought of in very high regard, but that is exactly what God calls his people to do. Follow me, right? Become a servant. Deny yourself. Notice exclusivity here in this phrase too. Serve what? Him. Serve him. Further differentiation from an improper fear. Serve Him, fear Him, nothing else. A fear of God alone and a service to God that, that allows no room for a fear and a service to anyone or anything else. Observe the, the peace and the, the blessings that are promised here. Do as the Lord commands that you will possess the land, verse 1. You'll have prolonged days, verse 2. It may be well with you, verse 3. Verses 10 to 12, Moses details blessings that God would give to them. Um, prosperous cities, houses filled with wealth, wells, vineyards, and olive groves. When, when God describes an improper fear in Deuteronomy, uh, we, we see accompanying words of emotion such as dismay, discouraged, dread, tremble, terrified. What do we find here? A proper fear of the Lord is free of worry, dread, or fight. If right, it is, it is peacefully content in serving God through faithful obedience. Are, are, are we promised these material blessings that Old Testament Israel was? No, we are not promised material blessings. We are promised spiritual blessings. We are actually promised far greater eternal riches and inheritance that awaits us in eternal glory. Okay? That is what we are promised, Christian. I will say, God is also very faithful to his servants physically as well. 
and financial. He is. But we are not under the same covenant standard uh, in regards to what we will receive, but we receive spiritual blessings from our, from our Father. We, we receive things. We're, we're told to be what? Laying up treasures in heaven that await us. The enemies in, in this passage, they're not gone. All right, This is still Deuteronomy. Israel has yet to enter Canaan. They've yet to fight. They've yet to go into the promised land. But, but peace is the overall tone of this text. Why is that? Because it's expected with a rightful direction of proper fear of the Lord comes a peace in serving him. Enemies will constantly be present. They will. Work is going to have to still be ongoing. Circumstances will be difficult. But serving God brings peace amidst all circumstances. Here's a third and final truth from this text about a proper fear. Number three, we see a proper fear glorifies God exclusively. Synonymous with this, this concept of God desiring um, a proper fear of Him is the truth that you were created for the purpose of bringing God glory. Verse 13 says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him and shalt swear by His name. To swear by God's name. This, this here is the, just the ex extreme expression of loyalty and glory. This is more than a name, okay? This is, this is God's character. Uh, I have it on the screen behind me in just a moment, but Isaiah 42 verse 8 clearly makes this connection to honoring God's name, bringing Him glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. There, there's this very real and clear connection between praise and glory that's attached to the name of the Lord. You know, this third bullet point here, that a proper fear glorifies God exclusively, it, it really piggybacks off the other two. Uh, you, 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 it starts with a loving obedience, it continues in faithful service, and it culminates with just having a, a single laser-like focus of just wanting one thing, bringing glory to God. The, the beauty of this relationship of trustful actions and, and living results for God uh, brings glory to God. When, when my son was three years old, I, as his father, decided he was at the point, he was ready in his bike riding career where the training wheels could come off the bike. I, I knew this because I observed him. I could assess his skill level. I, I knew he was ready for this next step. So off came the training wheels. And I encouraged him, and I, I told him exactly what would happen, how I'd be right there next to him. I wouldn't let him fall, and I gave him instructions on, on just how to master riding without the wheels on, the training wheels on, and, and how to keep his balance. Well, for days, I'd run beside him, and I'd, I'd hold the bike steadily next to him. But he was deathly afraid that he was going to fall when I let go of the seat. Well, eventually the day came where I knew this was going to be the day that I stopped holding on to the bike. And he didn't know this. I didn't think he needed to know this. So, in essence, it was unknown to him. So I took him to a grassy field, right, in case of a possible fall, which we never rode on a grassy field. You would have thought that would have triggered his mind, but he was three. So I took him to a grassy field, and in case he did fall, he would have some, you know, some, some, some cushion. And after a few seconds of me running beside him, I took my hands off the seat. And maybe a moment, a second or two went by, and he looked back and realized Dad was no longer holding on to the seat. He, he thought he was going to fall, and I confidently yelled to him, Hey, don't worry. I, I could see the fear on his face. Trust me, son. I, I'm, I'm only an arm's length away, but you have to keep going. And you know what happened? The, the, the fear turned to delight because soon he was going on his own, and he was gone. I mean, a couple hundred, not gone, a couple hundred feet into the distance. And as he circled back, as he circled back, I knew, you know what? He knew that his dad had a history of fulfilling his word. He knew me. Dad's faithful. Dad knows best. And as I watched him circle back to me, hundreds of feet of way, in the distance, I, I was glorying in the fact that my son trusted me, that he trusted me over his fears, that he lovingly obeyed me, that he peacefully was smiling, enjoying the blessing of, and the joy of riding his bike without training wheels. 
in, in a way, this bears similarity to your relationship with God as your father. If you're saved, you're in a relationship with God through Christ alone. And it's built on love. God loves you and desires that you trustfully obey him. You demonstrate love by your obedience to him. And the more you trust him, the more you obey him. The less you're controlled by improper fear, and the more you experience peace through living in a proper fear of God. Though, through, through past experiences, you, you trust him in the present to make good on his promises that are still to come in the future. But, but here is where the illustration breaks down between me and my son. The difference between my relationship with my son and God's relationship with us is that as much as I love my son, as much as I would do anything I could for him, I am still imperfect, and I have let him down many times in the past. But he still trusts me, and he still obeys me. Christian, your, your heavenly father's never failed. He's never failed. His love is perfect. 1 John 4.18 declares, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. He promises to never leave you. It, it's impossible for him to fail you. And when you lovingly submit to him, when you lovingly serve him and follow and obey and trust him, not only do you, do you have a peace and a contentment in any state, but, but you also, you fulfill what God has designed and created you to do, to give him glory. And that pleases him. And as I watched my son with confidence on his face and, and have peace and trust in me, when you fear the Lord and display a perfect trust in him, as your father, he smiles because you're giving him the glory alone. You know, that, that famous statement in FDR's inaugural address, it may have rallied a nation, but it, it's actually an incorrect statement. You see, biblically, there is a rational fear that every Christian might, should have. FDR said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But you know what God tells you from his word? The only thing you have to fear is God himself. Israel they were urged to fear not. Even though it appeared they were outmatched by, by might and outnumbered by nations and they were going into unknown territory, God told Israel he'd fight for them. He was among them. He was with them. And God built his case of promises on the future based on past deliverances. If you're a Christian, okay, you're not under the covenantal nature anymore of Deuteronomy. But, but yet there are many similarities in this text that apply to us. Here are just a few. Like Israel, God chose to save you and to redeem you from a life of slavery to sin. And by his grace, he bought you for himself by his son. Like Israel, God demands loving obedience and faithful service to following him. Like Israel, your obedience and fearing of God points to God and brings him glory. Like Israel, you have promises of future rest and freedom from sin and the trials of living in a fallen world. But like Israel, you have to continue in obedience. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.2, it says, be found faithful. That's continuing. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Hebrews 12.1, run with patience the race that is set before you. And you do this until he calls you home to his perfect promised land, or he returns, whichever comes first, and then we will live forever in the fear of the Lord. This is a message you need to be reminded of, because I needed to be reminded of it. This is a message an unsaved world needs to hear. But fear is everywhere. But, but there's only one fear that we should have, and it's not debilitating. It's a freeing fear in a relationship with God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he desires that we display a spirit of having a proper fear of the Lord. That's not some contrived sort of Bible double talk, okay? Improper fear and proper fear, they're, they're distinct opposites. One brings you closer to God, one brings you further from him. One brings peace, one brings despair. One brings God glory, one brings God shame. I, I don't know your personal enemy this morning. I don't. I don't know the enemy that's attempting to draw you into some improper fear from a proper fear of God. These improper fears of Israel, I mentioned this already, they're, they're still the same, our modern day buckets today of fears that we face. 
improper fears of a situation that seems to be too powerful for you to handle, a situation where it seems like you have everything stacked against you, or a, a fear of the unknown. Your temptation will be different from mine, but your fears are real. I'm not diminishing that. Uh, but, but your fear, you, you have to make this, this, this willful choice. I don't, need, I don't need to know your problem, but I do know the prescription. The prescription is the same to any and all. Turn to the Lord. Turn to God. You have to be willful in this. Uh, the anecdote for improper fear, we looked at this, 1 John 4, 18. But, but listen to the whole verse. There is no love in fear, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Obedience and love, they're, they're, they're inseparable with God. They must go together. You can obey his word and not love him. But you can never love him and not obey him. You won't find that in Scripture. Scripture is uniformly clear on that. Fear, it, it really issues forth from love. And here's what I mean by that. We fear because we love something. We love ourselves, so we, we fear bad things happening to us. We love our families. There's nothing wrong with that. We love our friends, our things, so we fear losing them. The more we fear something, the more we become engrossed with it, and we just can't let it go. Whether we're fascinated or repelled by whatever the object of our fear is, there, there's common traits to all fear. They arise from what we love. And the more you fear God, the less you'll fear anything else. The more you fear God, the more you'll want of Him. The more you'll want in, in your relationship with Him. And you'll, you'll fear Him more in this relationship. The contrast from God's word is clear, right? There's a difference between being afraid of God and fearing God. Those who have the fear of him will never be afraid of him. Those that have a fear of God will never be afraid of him. Sinful fear, it, it, fear, it, it drives you away from God. It, 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 at a proper fear, it drives you nearer to him. If you've never come to know him, if you say, I've never come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, oh, it's, it's so easy because the hard part was done by Christ. And you can experience the glorious truth of salvation. You can come and speak with anyone after service this morning. would love to be able to share with you from the Word how you can begin a relationship of a proper fear in the Lord. This message, I, I hope you're not taking it as a message of gloom. This is actually a message of encouragement because the nature of a living God means that that fear which pleases him, it's, it's not a groveling fear. It's not a shrinking fear because God is not a tyrant. God is no tyrant. He is not. It's, it's an overwhelming joy when you sense just how overwhelmingly kind and magnificent God and how true God is. And therefore, the, the one that can lean on him can really just, just stand in, in a sort of staggered sense of praise and trustful faith, just like we looked at in Psalm 62, 11 to open our service, mercy and power belongs unto God, and I can be in a relationship with Him. So a question put forth this morning, will you glorify God by, by lovingly obeying Him and faithfully serving Him and enjoying the benefits of a peaceful relationship with Him? Will you walk by faith? Or are you going to continue to walk by a debilitating fear? Will you trust in he who knows the unknown? Will you follow the Savior? Will you live confidently? Or are you going to live cowardly? Really, that the question boils down to, will you live in fear or will you live in a fear of the Lord? Let us pray this morning, and as we do, if the men would please get in their positions for the offering. Father, you're so good to us, abundant in goodness, steadfast in love, your mercy endures to all generations. Father, there are certain so many things that our eyes can see that would tell us we, we ought to be fearful. But Lord, we, we know from the scriptures that we, we, we ought to be walking by faith. I pray that we'd lean into our relationship with you more and more each day. And that, Father, the more we have a proper fear, living in a reverent and proper fear of you, the less we'll have a fear of everything else. Lord, if there is one in here this morning that, that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they'd ask someone that today would be the, the day of their salvation and they can leave here rejoicing with us and being in a relationship with the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God Almighty. 
Father, we do thank you for our time here this, this, this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be honored throughout the rest of our service, through the, the giving of our offerings and uh, through the final song that we sing of praise this, evening, this, this morning as we leave here. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Did it and very appreciated. Let us stand. We will close this morning with singing hymn 56, To God Be the Glory. And um, Wilford, would you close us in prayer after the last song, please? Thank you. Thank you.